the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology has come to order and say good morning to you and thank you for being so punctual and at your places. And I think uh, some of my staff has urged you to stay within the limit of the five minutes. We're going to relegate our questions to three minutes each because they're gonna, we're going to have to go vote in a little bit, and we know your time is valuable and the other witnesses' time is semi-valuable. And uh, we... Uh, want to uh, give each of us the same length of time to talk. Thank you all. And I thank the members for and uh, welcome today to our hearing this entitled Out of Thin Air, EPA's Cross-State Air Pollution Rule. And in front of your packets are containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth in testimony for everybody here and disclosures for today's witnesses. Today's hearing includes two panels which I'll note for the record is not the typical practice of our committee. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. And I'd relegate myself to three minutes, but I don't know what part of this I'd leave out because I didn't write any of it, but I'm going to read most of it. I want to welcome everyone here today for this hearing entitled Out of Thin Air, EPA's Cross-State Air Pollution Rule. I particularly want to thank all the witnesses on the first panel who provided their testimony on time. Uh, despite being told more than three weeks in advance about this hearing, we had a little problems with the other uh, testimony that's given, but maybe everybody has a reason for that. So we usually try to overlook that, but urge them and thank you all for being punctual and, and being responsive. Uh, a week ago, uh, President Obama gave a speech about jobs and asked Congress to give him $450 billion in new money to spend. As we debate the merits of that proposal, I hope the administration will recognize the single most important thing it can do for the economy it doesn't cost a dime. All it takes is for the president to assert some leadership and get the out-of-control EPA to stop its regulatory assault on American jobs. The issue today uh, before us is a prime example of that. The cross-state rule is intended to ensure upwind states do not negatively impact the air quality of their downwind neighbors, a seemingly reasonable concept. In reality, however, it serves as another monument to the activist EPA's legacy of putting bad politics ahead of good science uh, without regard to economics. To fully state the number of problems with this rule would far take, exceed my five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes it would take me. But there are a few that require mentioning first. Issuing a rule forcing major installations of pollution control equipment and expecting states to comply with it five months later is unheard of, even by EPA's previous track record, and appears to be setting up states to fail. To add insult to injury, EPA added Texas and several other states to the rule at the last minute without giving affected stakeholders the ability to review or comment on this decision. Incredibly, EPA has staked its justification for the inclusion of Texas on the basis of a single projected impact on a county in Illinois. Just to be clear, EPA has modeled a potential effect in a single area hundreds of miles away. This has not been actually measured. In fact, that county even is currently meeting the standard. Uh, furthermore, the model assumptions EPA used to estimate such linkages are hidden from the public and not subject to peer review. These black box models allow EPA to pick and choose its input data and assumptions free from technical uh, scrutiny. This is not how science really should be done. Today we'll hear from witnesses from states that have been adversely affected by this rule. The concerns are the same, not enough time, EPA's abuse of modeling to justify the rule, and electrical reliability concerns that will result from the rule's implementation. As for my state of Texas, it's important to note that it's a clean air success story. Through a flexible pro-jobs, all of the above energy strategy, Texas has achieved recent environmental progress that eclipsed many other states in the country. Since 1995, electric utilities in Texas have reduced sulfur dioxide emissions by 26 percent, NOx emissions by 62 percent. The cross-state air pollution rule requires Texas to reduce its SO emissions by an additional 47% by January 1st, 2012. 
Last week during a congressional hearing, Assistant Administrator Gina McCarthy stated, I don't want to create the impression that EPA is in the business of creating jobs. A little sarcastic, I think. I want to assure Ms. McCarthy not to worry. Americans are not getting that impression from EPA. And I frankly think it's a shame that the administration official to make a smart aleck remark like that when people are in jeopardy of losing their job and having to come home and tell their family that they don't have a job and they can't provide for them. We're in a desperate time to have that kind of talk. Uh, just this week, Texas companies have announced that they'll have to cut jobs specifically in response to this rule. EPA may not be in the business of creating jobs, but with more than 9% unemployment, it certainly should not be in the business of destroying them either, which is what will happen if this rule goes into effect the way they have planned it. And I now represent, uh, recognize our very fine ranking member, Mrs. Johnson, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. And let me apologize for being a little late. I was stuck in the 395 tunnel after the police <laughs> cut it off for 30 minutes. And uh, so I got here a lot later than I intended. I had really intended to have breakfast before coming. Uh, <laughs> but let me commend you for having the, um, the finalized uh, cross-state air pollution rule, effectively known as CASPER. Uh, this is a very complex and contentious regulatory issue and not one that would fall within the committee's purview. But the principle is simple and embodied in Clean Air Act's good neighbor provision. Air pollution doesn't stop at the state line, just as it does in its city limits. And while the pollution from one state affects the air quality of another, measures should be taken to mitigate that impact. For instance, the emissions of some pollutants from my home state of Texas with this blooming economy, growing population, and vibrant fossil energy sector are some of the highest in the country. You can't fence it in. So it stands to reason that the effects will be felt somewhere downwind and that we owe it to our neighbors to clean up our act. The hard part is figuring out how. This is why we have EPA and why Congress and the Republican president passed the Clean Air Act to identify threats to the environment and public health and determine the fairest and most cost-effective ways to remedy them. However, much we might wish for a world where big environmental issues are addressed voluntarily by industry are through the workings of the free market and are, at, are best regulated by the individual states. We all know that it just does not work that way. Now more than ever, the American people need a strong EPA to protect their rights of clean air and clean water. I'm a nurse by profession. I know the statistics of the lungs that are being affected by all of this pollution. That said, while I will always be a strong defender of EPA's charge to protect public health and the environment, I am concerned about their process for the inclusion of Texas in the final transport rule this time. As indicated in the letter, my colleagues and I from Texas, that I sent to OMB, some important affected parties in Texas feel that they did not have sufficient opportunity to comment. These parties will likely have difficulty meeting the timeline of the final rule. I am not, and nor is EPA, a job killer. We are simply trying to protect the lives of the people. I simply feel that stakeholders need more time to work with EPA on an economically and environmentally responsible solution, a solution that I know we can reach, we have evidence. With so much at stake in this and other rules, EPA cannot afford to get bogged down and derailed by procedural missteps. What the public state governments and industry stakeholders need more than anything is regulatory certainty that allows for long-term investment planning. I sincerely hope that this is somewhat irregular and confusing process has not laid the groundwork for what could be a protracted battle when in the end clean air is everyone's best interest. 
beyond those concerns, let me make this opportunity, take this opportunity to clarify where I stand on the broader concern about EPA. First, do not mistake my position on this single issue as standing with Governor of Texas Perry or others in the Republican Party in the misguided, disingenuous war on the dedicated scientists and public servants at the EPA. So I do not join my governor in this race to the bottom as he seeks um, to outcompete the rest of the country in tearing down environmental and public health protections. I stand with the people of Texas who, regardless of where they fall in the partisan divide, universally agree that they have a right to clean air and clean water and that respiratory diseases, heart attacks, premature deaths are not part of the sacrifice we have to make for the sake of the Texas miracle. Air quality related illnesses have very real and destructive effects on the economy. On the order of hundreds of billions of dollars annually and the benefits for reducing those effects will be seen throughout our country. Second, Despite the noise from the echo chamber on the right, on the whole, EPA regulations do not, do not, do not kill jobs. From catalytic, catalytic converters to CFCs, scrubbers to seat belts, for decades we've heard how almost every major environmental consumer protection act that Congress considers will decimate the American industrial base and result in irreparable economic disruption, only to see the power of American innovation quickly leave these cynics and pessimists in the dark. In fact, there is much more evidence showing that jobs are created and the economy expands following the passage of major reforms. For example, the U.S. economy grew by 64 percent in the years following the passage of the Clean Air Act and recent vehicle fuel economy and emission standards have already resulted in the creation of 150,000 jobs. And that's um, some of the, the figures that have not just been tabulated by EPA, but others as well. Yes, some types of the industries will see a decline in the face of new regulations. That is very true of much of what we see. Technology, though, makes a difference. In Texas, I'm over my time, but Mr. Hall, let me finish. In Texas, depending on how the relevant forms decide to comply, we stand to lose a number of rural jobs to lignite mines and power plants. I truly hate to see any family suffer a job loss, but I am an optimist with well-founded faith that ultimately these regulations act as a catalyst for the creation of new jobs in industrial sectors and for the hard-working and talented Texas workforce will be the ones to benefit in the end. In conclusion, my position on the specific issue of Texas inclusion in the final transport uh, rule is clear. Texas needs more time to consider the full implications of the rule to submit comments to EPA and possibly to prepare for implementation. Too many jobs in our state are at stake in the short term. However, my position on the protection of public health through higher air and water quality standards and our ability to meet those standards through homegrown innovation should be equally clear and never in question. The sooner we learn that we do not have to sacrifice jobs for a cleaner environment, the sooner we will see a more robust economy and a healthier public. Two things that we all look forward to. Thank you. Gentlelady. Yields back her time. If there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record uh, at this point. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to introduce our first witness panel. Dr. Brian Shaw is the chairman of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and also an associate professor in the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Department of Texas A&M University. Prior to his current appointment, Dr. Shaw was an associate director of the Center of agricultural air quality engineering and science and has served as a member of the EPA uh, Science Advisory Board Environmental Engineering Committee. Uh, next we have Gregory Stella. 
uh, senior scientist at Alpine Geophysics. Mr. Stella is internationally recognized as a technical authority in the planning, development, evaluation, and modeling of local, national, and international emissions inventories and policy options for the projection and control of ozone and particulate matter pollutants and precursors. Uh, our third witness is Barry T. Smitherman, a recent appointed commissioner on the Texas Railroad Commission. He's also a member of the National Association of Regulatory Unit, the uh, Commissioner's Board of Directors, and the Committee on Energy Resources and the Environment. In his prior role as Chairman of the Public Utility Commission of Texas, he served as an ex officio board member the, on the Electric Reliability Council of Texas and Vice President of the Regional State Committee for the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, next, we have Mr. Wayne E. Penrod, Executive Manager of Environmental Policy at the Sunflower Electric Power Corporation in Kansas. He's responsible for Sunflower's compliance with all federal and state environmental regulations permitting and reporting activities for Sunflower's uh, generation facilities. Uh, rounding out the panel, we have Mr. Chip Merriam, uh, Chief Legislative and Regulatory Compliance Officer of the Orlando Cities Commission. Mr. Merriman is uh, responsible for managing energy and water regulatory and compliance matters for the Orlando Utilities Commission and is heavily involved in the development of state of Florida and federal legislative policy. And as our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, after which the members of the committee will have three minutes each to ask questions. Uh, and we hope you can stay as close to the five minutes, but if you have to run over, we understand that. We recognize, and on both sides of the docket, recognize that you're giving up time for your preparation for being here, for your travel here, for your service here, and you're uh, going back to wherever you came from. So we won't be really uh, bad on you if you go over the five minutes. So I guess at this time I now recognize... Uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Brian Shaw, Chairman of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Thank you, Chairman Hall. Members, uh, my name is Brian Shaw. I am the Chairman of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, also, as you pointed out, I'm on leave of absence as a professor in agricultural engineering at Texas A&M University, so I will try to uh, rein in my natural uh, desire to speak for 50 minutes at a time and try to stay under the five-minute mark. I want to talk about this rule, the uh, cross-state air pollution rule specifically, uh, talk about the, the concerns we have with the lack of due process that was afforded the state of Texas in this process, and not just because of the lack of due process, but because of the specific implications in this matter. Uh, both you and, and Member Johnson have, have pointed out some of the concerns with the timing, and specifically I want to lay out that, that process as it occurred. Texas was proposed only in the ozone seasonal requirements in the proposed rule. Uh, those are those uh, requirements for May to September. In the final rule, Texas was included not only for the ozone, but also in the annual standard for PM 2.5 and specifically in the Group 2 SO2 trading uh, component, which gives us a, a very short time frame, less than three and a half months from today, January 2012, to comply with this regulation. The lack of adequate notice and meaningful opportunity for comment uh, occurred because of the fact that in the proposed uh, cater, as it was, the cross-state air transport rule, they did not include Texas in the annual programs for NOx and SO2 reductions for PM2.5. In fact, EPA's own models acknowledged that Texas did not exceed the linkages that would be necessary to include us in that. At rule finalization, and for the very first time, Texas was included and linked to a monitor in Granite City, Illinois, and included in the federal implementation plan for the 1997 PM2.5 standard. Because Texas was not significantly linked in the PM 2.5 uh, monitor proposal, it was not possible for the state to provide meaningful comment on the technical underpinnings of a linkage to any particular one monitor among dozens of non-attainment or maintenance receptors for PM 2.5 covered by rule. EPA maintains throughout its rule preamble and in response to comment that Texas had ample opportunity and for uh, and notice of a potential inclusion and need not have been provided additional information on possible linkages or proposed budgets in order to provide meaningful comment. In fact, what EPA took comment on in the proposal was a questionable scenario whereby EPA um, posited that Texas might increase its sulfur dioxide emissions in, in effect because the rule was likely to make it cheaper to burn higher sulfur coal. The state of Texas and others commented on the fallacy of that approach, and EPA abandoned that and instead relied on a newly found and created linkage which first appeared at final linkage. Interestingly, EPA 
uh, provided six other states that their supplemental modeling uh, from the time of proposal to, to final of the finalization of the rule, additional modeling linked them for ozone to other uh, uh, sites that weren't included in the proposal. They, instead of moving forward, include those linkages and include them in the rule at final. They afforded those six states supplemental notice and opportunity for comment, even though three of those states, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Michigan, had been linked to other monitors, which Texas was not in the initial rule. It seems, uh, EPA seems to understand that those other states need an opportunity to comment on the linkages, but not Texas. EPA's insistence that Texas knew its inclusion in this program and that it was possible that was going to occur and therefore inclusion under a wholly separate and unproposed scenario was reasonable raises both due process concerns and equity concerns. Texas was only provided the final emissions budget for SO2 and NOx at, fi at rule finalization. EPA apparently believes a proposed emission budget is not necessary for adequate notice and comment. However, every other state included in this rule will receive a proposed budget or a budget at proposal. Now it seems that having had our first uh, meeting with EPA, though I requested a meeting with the administrator prior to the finalization of the rule, uh, we were uh, we met with the deputy administrator, uh, just I'm going to say his name, Bob uh, Perchisepi, per per and EPA seems to be wanting to look at finding ways to minimize the unintended impact of this rule on a case-by-case -case basis, specifically suggesting they may be able to provide additional budget allow allocations for emissions on a case-by-case -case basis. This shows clearly the EPA does not understand the competitive wholesale market-based approach that Texas has and doesn't recognize the challenges with being able to move forward and ensure that we have the reliability issues uh, that are necessary to keep the lights on and keep the Texans safe whenever we have adverse weather conditions that, that make us rely on adequate air conditioning and other power uh, uh, supply. As you look at the, the linkage that EPA created, it was a 0.18 micrograms per cubic meter, which is 0 0.03 micrograms per cubic meter. That's three, uh, 0 0.03 millionths of a gram per cubic meter above the linkage threshold to a monitor in Granite City, Illinois. Uh, this linkage is tenuous, and yet, based on this, EPA has recommended that t Texas have a 47% reduction in our SO2 emissions from the 2010 level. Uh, point out that Texas has had a great deal of success. In fact, we have reduced our emissions by over 32 percent in SO2 emissions from 1999 to 2010. This rule does not provide adequate time for us to address this moving forward, and EPA can't undo the negative consequences of this rule simply by trying to address those uh, those in, the errors in their data and the errors in their analysis, specifically with ERCOT, uh, with regard to reliability of the uh, Texas system, and we need to have an opportunity for full vetting so that we avoid the consequences I've spoken of. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today, sir, and members. Thank you very much. Uh, I now recognize our second witness, Mr. Gregory Stella, senior scientist at Alpine Geophysics. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today regarding the results of two recent independent studies that my firm, Alpine Geophysics, has conducted on behalf of the Midwest Ozone Group. These two studies utilize state of the science data, methods, and models to assess the needs for the types of emission reductions contemplated by the cross-state air pollution rule. We conducted these analyses of emission reductions and air quality improvements for purposes of comparing them to EPA's findings from its modeling of the proposed clean air transport rule now finalized as the cross-state air pollution rule. Specifically, we've identified two major areas in which our assessment differs distinctly from that conducted by EPA. Firstly, EPA did not use the most recently available emissions inventories and air quality measurements at the time of its rulemaking. And secondly, EPA did not account for the air pollution controls and related emission reductions that have been or are being installed to satisfy the requirements of the Clean Air Interstate Rule, or CARE. Our first study was designed to quantify historical changes in ozone and particulate matter precursor emissions and the associated changes in air quality attributed to those emission changes during a 10-year period covering 1999 through 2009. On regional and state levels, our findings confirmed that across the lower 48 states, all pollutants have typically decreased since 1999. In particular, NOx and SO2 emissions from electric utility fuel combustion sources have significantly decreased as the result of the acid rain program NOx budget trading program, and care control implementation. With respect to mobile sources, all studied pollutants, except ammonia, decreased over time as a result of various fuel and fleet rulemakings. Correspondingly, we computed ozone and fine particulate matter design value trends for each region in the United States for the same period of 1999 through 2009. 
Our results again demonstrated that average 8-hour ozone and both the average annual and 24-hour PM2.5 design values have decreased across the nation during this 10-year period. Noticeably, EPA did not rely on this more recent air quality data in the development of the cross-state air pollution rule, instead relying on older air quality monitoring data that do does not reflect these improvements. The objective of our second study was to perform technically credible photochemical modeling, including the EPA attainment test, for three key years, 2008, 2014, and 2018, in a study area that includes much of the central, midwestern, and northeastern United States. As a result of this modeling and use of the most recent emissions and observational air quality measurements and design value calculations, we found that in 2008, within our study area, air quality was much better than was assumed by EPA in the cross-state air pollution rule, with only three counties exceeding the 1997 eight-hour ozone NACs, all but nine counties in attainment with the annual PM2.5 NACs, and 21 counties in non-attainment with the 24-hour PM2.5 NACs. Additionally, our future year simulations of 2014 and 2018 indicated that within our study area, all counties and monitors achieved eight-hour ozone attainment by 2014 and remained in attainment in 2018. Only one county, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, affected largely by local sources, was found to remain in non-attainment of the annual PM2.5 NACs in 2014 and 2018. And only two counties, also ones affected by local sources, were found to remain in non-attainment of the 24-hour PM2.5 NACs in 2014 and 2018. From these results, we found that the ozone objectives of the cross-state air pollution rule can be achieved no later than 2014, and that both annual and 24-hour PM2.5 NACs can be met in 2014 in all counties within our study area, except for those affected by local sources, with no new controls beyond those that have been or are being constructed to satisfy the requirements of care. In summary, our studies and associated results indicate that significant ozone and particulate matter precursor emission reductions have occurred in the United States since 1999, and that air quality has improved more rapidly than has been predicted by EPA in the development of the cross-state air pollution rule. Additionally, by using no more than recent emissions and air quality concentration data, the majority of non-attainment and maintenance counties identified in EPA's cross-state air pollution rule analysis are found to be in attainment by 2009, with both the ozone and particulate matter NAAQS objectives of the final rule. Finally, our modeling demonstrates that the air quality objectives of the cross-state air pollution rule can be achieved in an eastern portion of the United States with no new controls beyond those being installed to satisfy EPA's original care. I thank you for your time and this opportunity to present this information before the committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions that member may ha members may have on this work. Mr. Teller, thank you very much. You stayed exactly within the five minutes. Uh, I will now recognize uh, uh, our third witness, Mr. Barry T. Smitherman, Commissioner of the Texas Railroad Commission. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee, the Texas Railroad Commission, which does not regulate railroads, but regulates the oil, gas, and coal industry in Texas, was founded in 1891. Prior to my appointment two months ago, I was for, for seven years on the Public Utility Commission, the last four as chairman. My testimony today is that the cross-state air pollution rule was promulgated using a flawed process will jeopardize the reliability of the Texas electric grid, which contains three of the ten largest cities in America and is home to the largest petrochemical industry in our nation. It will also eliminate many high-paying jobs. In the original version, of, as you have heard, the state of Texas, along with three other states, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Mississippi, was included only for seasonal ozone. As a result, neither Texas regulators, the Texas electric grid operator, or industry participants were given notice that more stringent regulations might be passed relating to coal-fired electric generation. And in fact, significantly, there was a map which detailed our status and the other states' status as well. In fact, in a report dated July the 21st, 2011, prepared by the ERCOT technical personnel, they said, quote, based on the proposed rule, an ERCOT study evaluating the expected impacts of all pending EPA regulations did not include 
any incremental impacts from CATER on the ERCOT system. With publication of the final version of CASPER on July the 6th, our worst fears were confirmed. In fact, in a rare public press release on July 19th, ERCOT leadership highlighted the surprise change the EPA made by including Texas and said, quote, CASPER could cause a shortage of generation necessary to keep the lights on in Texas. Subsequently, on September the 1st, ERCOT completed a detailed study of the effects of CASPER and concluded that it would impact the reliability of the Texas electric grid by requiring between 1,200 and 6,000 megawatts of generation to not run during certain periods of the year. On several days this past summer, ERCOT experienced record demand for electricity on our grid, and we were required to ask load to voluntarily curtail in order to keep the lights on. We also, Mr. Chairman, imported power from Mexico during several of these periods of time. In other words, if the plant closures that were announced this week by Luminate had been in effect this past summer, we would have been unable to keep the lights on for several days. Now that puts lives at risk, but in addition to doing that, approximately 1,300 megawatts of electric generation and three lignite mines to support that generation will close according to recent announcements. That kills 500 high-paying jobs in Texas and hurts the Texas economy. Approximately 3,000 Texans work directly in the lignite mining industry, which is responsible for over $1.3 billion in annual gross product. As Dr. Shaw said, Texas has been recognized for reducing SO2 emissions over the last 10 years. But if allowed to go forward, CASPER would require a 47 percent reduction in Texas in less than six months. Now, Texas has been able to achieve much of our air quality improvements by increasing the amount of electricity coming from wind energy and from natural gas fire generation. Air quality in Texas will continue to improve without the implementation of CASPER. We have over 10,000 megawatts, more than any other state, of wind energy on our grid, and that number is likely to increase. More significantly, New unconventional natural gas discoveries in Texas using horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing techniques make available vast quantities of cheap burning natural gas. When natural gas is used to make electricity, members, electricity rates are very low. In Dallas today, you can purchase electricity for less than five cents a kilowatt hour. I believe that going forward, as we add natural resources generation resources in Texas to meet our growing economy where jobs are still being created. Much of that will be done using clean burning natural gas. In short, Mr. Chairman, Texas needs time to retrofit our plants to comply with CASPER and please not focus on killing more jobs and jeopardizing the reliability of our grid and the lives of many of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for giving us back almost a minute. Uh, and by the way, I had breakfast with Elizabeth Ames Jones, one of your commissioners, this morning earlier. Uh, who's watching the, the gate down there in Texas? Commissioner Porter, sir. All right. That's good. Thank I now recognize our fourth witness, Mr. Wayne E. Penrod, Executive Manager of Environmental Policy of the Sunflower Electric Power Corporation. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hall, uh, Ranking Member Johnson. I appreciate the opportunity to come today to talk to you about the circumstances that we find ourselves uh, related to the clean uh, cross-state air pollution rule, which we call Zapper. Um, the problems with this rule are notice, uh, a lack of transparency as it relates to the modeling and the impacts that our sources might have, uh, reliability, that is, the ability to keep the lights on as a result of the uh, uh, electricity distribution uh, that's assumed by the rule, and four is the time it will take to comply with the rule and how we're to go about uh, achieving uh, compliance with it. In the attachments to my uh, testimony, I had a couple of slides, uh, one of which was the 2005 CARE uh, states, uh, and the, the second was the uh, cross-state air pollution rule states that are impacted. Conspicuous by their absence in the first slide, Kansas, Nebraska, 
and Oklahoma, and to some degree uh, a difference in classification for Texas and Minnesota. As late as fall, uh, excuse me, late as January of 2011, January this year, the last, number three, notice of data availability published by the EPA relative to the Clean Air Transport Rule, Kansas utilities were not looking at any required reductions in emissions. Um, in fact, Sunflower uh, didn't even have the opportunity or take the opportunity to file comments because we didn't expect to be impacted at all by the uh, final rule that was uh, to be uh, promulgated by EPA. That turned out not to be the case. We are primarily a single coal-based unit that operates in the western uh, half of uh, Kansas, and, um, and that's our primary source of energy uh, for our people. As the whole unit was going to uh, uh, suffer a 50 percent load carrying capacity as a result of the passage of the clean air uh, or the cross state air pollution rule. 50 percent. We were suggested that we might be able to buy energy, that we might be able to uh, fuel switch, that we might be able to uh, install gas capacity. All those things in six months uh, are, are beyond uh, the pale, frankly, as suggestions as a way we might be able to comply with this rule. Kansas is unique in several respects, aside from being flat. Um, there are 15 coal-based units in Kansas. Ten of them are fairly large units. Of those ten, uh, seven of them are, are scrubbed. Only one large one is not. All are equipped with some version of low-nox burners or overfire air. One of the large units has selective catalytic reduction. As we look around, we don't see how those units, some of them legacy units, are going to be able to reduce their emissions of either NOx or SO2 uh, beyond the levels that are required in this, uh, in this CASPER rule. In fact, one of the uh, plants has a super compliance opportunity. Uh, that's words in their consent order. Uh, that preceded their uh, uh, being uh, able to uh, retrofit some of their old scrubbers with new ones. So we wonder why we're included. Um, I've heard some of the uh, discussion earlier about uh, re uh, receptors in, in other states and how those uh, receptors cause us maybe to think about why we should be included. We have that same concern. We know that when CARE was first proposed, Kansas was included, but by virtue of uh, some discussions that we had with EPA and some review and evaluation of the data that they used in, in developing their model. Uh, we took exception to it, were able to make corrections, and Kansas was suddenly not a part of that rule. We think maybe that's really what needs to happen here. Unfortunately, we were not afforded the opportunity to communicate with them uh, and to try to get a, a remodel run uh, that might show that. Reliability is uh, a major concern. One of the slides in my attachment again shows uh, a picture of the um, impact on reliability, actually a, a percent voltage uh, that we expect to see in a base case in Kansas, and you see a few small faded white dots. And when the, when the uh, EPA base case is imposed on that same uh, scale, you see a lot of bright lights. Those are negatives. It will be bright dark, frankly in those places where those uh, situations occur. We, we don't expect to escape summer operation without some major energy shortages, and it will be rather sudden and rather widespread in our part of the state. So those are the things that we see that are problems with this uh, reliability. Uh, I would tell you that we are unique in another respect. Sunflower has a shovel-ready project that we were able to advance two years. Uh, and we're going to start installing Lonox burners and overfire air on our coal-based unit beginning the 1st of January. Very unusual circumstance, but this is an unusual rule. And we can't wait till 2013 to figure out whether or not we can uh, buy allowances that might cover our emissions. So we're, we're doing that. Um, we're going to pay a penalty. It's going to cost us probably 30 percent more to do that work than when we uh, originally intended to do it, which was 2013. Also, we find that rather than being able to purchase burners made in Kansas, they are going to be imported from China. Uh, we're going to meet the schedule. We're not going to suffer uh, the inability to meet the load with our lowest cost, most reliable unit 
uh, that serves the people in the western half of Kansas. I thank you for the opportunity to come today and speak with you about this. Uh, thank you. We now recognize our uh, final witness for this panel, uh, uh, Mr. Chip Merriam, uh, Chief Legislative and Regulatory Compliance Officer of the Orlando Utilities Commission, for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Hall and, and uh, Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, I represent the Orlando Utilities Commission, known as OUC, the reliable one. We're the second largest municipal generator of electricity in the state of Florida. We're the 16th largest in the nation. We are uh, able to provide service to the cities of Orlando, St. Cloud, and parts of unincorporated Orange and Osceola counties. One of the things that uh, we would like to rec be recognized for is we are an example of one of the closest connections between regulatory decisions that are made in Washington and the ratepayers that are paying the salaries, the bills of you know, for organizations such as ours. Such as ours. Federal regulatory rules and implementations are burdensome, and we all know that they have impacts associated with them. Our commission and our board is going, is, has strived and will continue to strive to make sure that we are environmentally good stewards, even though we burn coal and we burn natural gas. We also have nuclear as well as landfill gas and solar available to us. We were prepared when the clean air interstate rule was brought forward. We worked with our trade agencies and organizations, we worked with EPA in commenting. We had a 2014 deadline as the others that were covered by this rule in order to be prepared for this to move forward. Under the clean air transport rule, again, we were prepared and we were actually capitalizing some of our uh, projects such as low NOx burners in order to achieve the deadline of 2014. As we move forward, the, the surprise for us was the immediacy of the cross-state air pollution rule. All of a sudden now, the target date to be achieved compliance is for us as a ozone season only state is May 1st. Our projects are still capitalized out to 2014. Florida has approximately 11,000 tons short in their allowances to achieve compliance using the method that was set forth by the cross state rule. We're going to have to achieve it by living within our own means within the state at this point in time. OUC has got a very unique water management system. In a state that re receives an average of 54 inches of rainfall a year, we have no discharge off of our site. We take all 54 inches of rain that contacts our landfill on site, contacts our generation facility, and we actually run it through our scrubbers and evaporate that water instead of discharging it into protected waters in the state of Florida. Additionally, we take wastewater from the Orange County wastewater treatment facility and we use that to cool our boilers and process, again, our electricity. We thought this was a significantly visionary approach in the 80s when we constructed the facility. What the cross-state rule is going to require us to do today in order to live within the means is we will have to take a portion, if not all, of one of our units, coal units, offline during the NOx season for the 156 days. We will also, in order to meet our reliability requirements, have to go out on the market and buy a power purchase agreement in order to bring energy in to make sure we meet our reliability requirements. What that's going to drive, which is unique to us in this rule, is we're going to have to find another way to manage that water on the site. So we're looking at up to upwards of 40 to $50 million of additional injection wells or other means in order to deal with this rainfall that we were trying to take care of on our own. And what also gives us some pause, and, and Ranking Member Johnson brought this forward, was the certainty that is required in order to meet the obligations of being a generator today. While we're sitting here talking about the cross-state rule, we're looking straight down the barrel of the uh, MAC rule to maximum achieved control technology, the CO2 news source performance standards, additional changes to PM 2.5 and NAX, coal ash, and 316B rules. All of these will have a significant impact as we have to modify, capitalize more projects on our site. What we would really like and what all the members have said here is the time. Same time and some of the same flexibility that was provided for in the care discussions and in the transport rule discussions. Our position is at this point, we're not gonna challenge the technical side of the rule if we can get the time. We're gonna build the things necessary to get there. Moving back the deadline to allow us to play and capital pay out and, and change the capital costs would be very beneficial to our rate payers. In closing, I would just like to emphasize that the Central Florida is still reeling today from the economic downturn that we've all been experiencing. Our unemployment's high. We've seen a significant increase of us having to deal with long-term customers uh, making utility payment arrangements because they cannot achieve, afford to pay their uh, current bills that are presented to them today. All these businesses have been hard, hit particularly hard. And 
if we have to increase our rates to manage water to make these generation changes because we're so close to our customers, it's a direct pass through to them. So it would be a, a, a new and a very difficult impact. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity. And I thank you. And I thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, and I yield myself the first three minutes. Uh, Mr. Stella addressed some of the omissions of the scientific information used by the EPA in arriving at their decision. I thank you for that. Uh, and the commissioner, uh, in plain language, at the cost of jobs and money. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Shaw, uh, our witness on the next panel, Gina McCarthy, uh, has claimed that the public health benefits far outweigh any cost Texas might experience. And whether or not we ought to experience them or not, I'm not asking you to get into that, but what, is, what are the real costs? Uh, they have already been enumerated that each of you are going to be damaged and be hurt. Would, do you have anything to add to, to their... Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Hall. Uh, specifically, I don't have the, the full numbers of what the cost will be because, frankly, the individual utilities are still trying to calculate what that strategy will be and what the cost associated with that will be. One thing we know that is clear is that the, uh, the health benefits are, are questionable, and that's part of the reason we need an opportunity to be able to vet this because there are assumptions both in the data of what's being emitted. You object to the time as much as you are the decisions. Uh, yes, sir, and, and, and partially because we need to be able to verify the decision. We found errors that make us believe that the decision is wrong, but without the opportunity for comment for an input, it's difficult to convince EPA of that. And moving forward saying, well, paper over it doesn't make those problems go away. And so there is a need for more time to be able to address the true cost, both in environmental benefits as well as in cost to comply. And, Commissioner, you have the same problems. As he elicits, you have anything in addition to your testimony? I, I would, Mr. Chairman, I would add well, how this. How would you answer, Ms. McCarthy? Uh, I would, I would say that when the lights go out in Texas, it's usually either 20 degrees or 105 degrees, and when that happens, vulnerable citizens are at risk, and there's a cost associated with that. All right, I yield back my time. Chair recognizes uh, Mrs. Johnson for her three minutes. I'm not going to be so cutting that um, five wouldn't hurt. You know, um, I was a practicing nurse before I went into politics, and I still visit hospitals. And I would invite you to visit the Children's Hospital in Dallas or either the Parkland Emergency Room, where we have the most uninsured people in the country, they go to the emergency room for sick care. Eighty-some percent of the young people that are admitted to Children's Hospital have respiratory problems. And more than that of the older people have the same thing in Parkland Emergency Room. And you can check that out. You're welcome to visit. I am not a person that's against business. But I do feel strongly that when we devise techniques and technologies that will protect the health of people, they are available. They are costly sometimes, but I, and I think that needs time. I think we can work out win-win situations, but it must be done. Reflect with me for a moment. I remember when we had a lot of lead and paint and a lot of lead and gasoline. And the rules came that had to change because it was damaging to health. The technologies came and now that's gone. It's a thing of the past and people and health of people have benefited from it. The technologies are possible. Many companies have met them. I am not saying that you don't need time to reach and achieve these changes. My question is, especially my Texas people, what are the new technologies that you're pushing? How successfully have you pushed them? And how important is the clean air rule to you as lawmakers, as, as rule makers? And, um, what would have been done without the regulations? 
Uh, Ranking Member Johnson, this is Brian Shaw. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to advance the, uh, to answer that question. I too share your concern for uh, addressing respiratory challenges. And, and part of the reason that it's I just part that you see it, but you know you got all kind of blood. Uh, Discrasures and everything else coming from a lot of this solution. Sure, and the key thing is my concern with the, the way this rule has been developed is we are, as I like to say, chasing the wrong rabbit potentially. We have very real environmental and health concerns we need to address, but if we have bad data that leads to the regulations and lead to where we invest both uh, private capital and, and government dollars, we won't see the benefits that are projected. And that's my concern is that EPA's data failed to, pre to present the evidence to where we know that's the proper place to invest. For example, I believe that there are likely other pollutant sources and other pollutants of concern that we need to focus on that will have very real health benefits. EPA, through the process they utilize, has not provided evidence so that we have the comfort that this was actually going to re result in those benefits that you and I both want. Ranking Member Johnson, if I may, great question. And here's what we've done. We're employing cleaner coal technologies in Texas. The new plants that are coming online are cleaner than the old ones, no question about it. We're using more natural gas, which has none of some, none, no mercury, no pollutant, less NOx, less SO2, 40% CO2. And we have more wind on the grid than any other state, 10,000 megawatts, probably doubling that. We're building transmission in order to enable us to get more energy out of our existing generation fleet. So I think we are pushing the envelope on technology, and it's achieving real results for us. Can we do more in the future? Of course we can. But these investments take time. Gentlelady's time has expired, and I have an agreement on both sides of the chair here that we have a vote up, and we have about eight minutes to get to that vote. And we're going to... Uh, you want to recognize Ms. We have time for Ms. Rohrbach. Yes. All right, they say we have time for Mr. Rohrbacher, uh, and I used a minute of his three minutes, so you have two minutes to go. <laughs> you got full two minutes, uh, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just note, and I'm sorry there were a group of young people here earlier, um, most of the kids in California believe that the air pollution level right now in California is so much worse than it was when I went to high school, and I ask them that every single time. Uh, the fact is, it's just the opposite. We have made dramatic progress in these last 20 and 30 years in terms of, of health-related uh, 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 diseases, in terms of uh, uh, pollutants in the air. Dramatic progress. And uh, once you uh, uh, try to start ignoring that and trying to frighten people, uh, we end up wasting money by frightening people that their progress isn't being made, and that money is totally evaporated, which could then have been used to actually make things better. And I think that's what we're facing today in this situation, Mr. Chairman. We've got what we have testimony, what we're hearing is that by eliminating the flexibility and speeding up this process, uh, we're going to waste hundreds of millions of dollars that could be used to actually buy the, make the capital investments that would cause real uh, progress in the future. Uh, Mr. Uh, Penrod, I guess we said, was 30 percent more, and we're going to buy foreign manufactured goods because of this speed up. Uh, Merriman said $50 million more, uh, and Mr. Smith has testified that uh, uh, air pollution was, has been dramatically down anyway and uh, since 1999. Um, we, uh, this, is, uh, this, this action by the EPA uh, is, uh, is being rushed onto us, and I might add, we have another example of what, that, of what this administration accomplishes when they rush through something. We have Sol, uh, Solandera, is that how you pronounce it? Solandera, uh, uh, um, the, their solar plant up there in, in, in Fremont, California, we just gave them $500 million, and now they're going bankrupt. Well, that's $500 million that now is evaporated from being able to create real jobs someplace else and be able to clean the air with, with real investments that are based on solid science 
rather than trying to scare people uh, into doing things prematurely before we've got the investment and the equipment ready to do the job. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and uh, thank you, panelists, for uh, giving us some very valuable information. And thank you, and I'd ask Mr. Harris, are you leaving? We have only five minutes to get over there, but I'd give you 30 seconds if you want okay. to. Right. Uh, don't judge our interest and appreciation of your here, either the Re Democrats or the Republicans, because they have, they're honoring two new members over there, and uh, there's special honors for them because they're two new Republicans. But uh, the Democrats are welcoming them, too, just like we are over there now. So we'll be over there. We're going to dismiss this panel. You're free to go when you want to. And uh, we, uh, you're excused, and we'll move to the next panel when we get back. And we will be coming back probably five minutes after the last vote over in the House, and I expect that will be 20 or 30 minutes from now, maybe 40 minutes. Thank you so much for good testimony, and thank you for your courtesy and for all the jobs. And, Mr. Commissioner, go back down there and get us some more oil and gas. Uh, <laughs> let's drill Anwar, too, just as soon as we can. With that, we are recessed. Okay, the committee will come to order. At this time, I'd like to introduce our second witness panel. Uh, the Honorable Gina McCarthy is the Assistant Administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to her confirmation, Ms. McCarthy served as a Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. She's worked at both the state and local levels on critical environmental issues and help coordinate policies on economic growth, energy, transportation, and environment. And as our witness probably knows, she's not a stranger to testifying on the Hill. Uh, the spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, but knowing of your schedule and our appreciation for you being here, if you go a little over that, why Ms. Johnson wouldn't let me hit the gavel at all, I know. So take what time you really need, and we appreciate you being here. At this time, I recognize you, Ms. McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Chairman Hall, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee, I do appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. The cross-state air pollution rule will cut power plants emissions from states in the eastern half of the country so that local communities can meet the Act's goals to reduce both smog and soot. Now, I understand that many members of the committee have expressed concern about the economic impacts associated with the cross-state rule. And while Congress did not set up EPA as a jobs creation organization or agency, um, as EPA's mission is public health and environmental protection, EPA nevertheless takes its job very seriously to look at the economic consequences of the rules that it develops it spends a great deal of time and resources on developing the best cost-benefit analysis we ha have. And we also have, as an administration, begun to address the analysis associated with jobs uh, more than any prior administration. And we have conducted a thorough cost-benefit and economic analysis, as well as a jobs analysis of the rule that's in discussion today. So each year, the cross-state rule will prevent tens of thousands of premature deaths and hundreds of thousands of aggregated, aggravated asthma attacks, including up to 1,700 premature deaths just in the state of Texas. Nationally, the rule will net 120 to $280 billion in annual benefits in 2014. Total health benefits in Texas will be between 5.8 in $14 billion annually in 2014. EPA had to issue the cross-state rule to replace the Bush administration's Clean Air Interstate Rule, or CARE, 
which the court said in 2008 did not meet Clean Air Act requirements. In the meantime, states' obligations to address transported emissions in the CARE program has remained in effect. Its emissions reduction requirements will end when the cross-state rules start. I will focus on two questions today. First, why is Texas in the cross-state rule? And secondly, can Texas comply with a program that begins in 2012? Texas was in CARE and is in the cross-state rule because NOx and SO2 emissions from its power plants significantly contribute to air pollution problems in at least one other state. Texas emissions also contribute to fine particle pollution in 11 other states, in ozone pollution in 13 other states. But that's not surprising because Texas emitted 462,000 tons of SO2 in 2010. In fact, Texas is the second largest emitter of the 27 states that are covered by this rule. Texas is home to three of the 11 largest power plant sources of SO2 emissions, all of which are owned by Luminant. If the, cro if the cross state rule excluded Texas, Texas was projected to increase the pollution it would send to other states. Texas, like all other states, has a legal responsibility to address air quality problems that it contributes to downwind. Texas had fair warning that it might be in the cross-state rule. Texas was in the CARE annual control program as early as 2005. EPA specifically proposed to include Texas in the summertime program, and EPA in the EPA's proposal also requested comment on including Texas in the annual programs, which provided sufficient both legal as well as practical notice. The state of Texas and the major Texas utilities, including Luminant, provided detailed comments on the proposal, including specifically the question of Texas's inclusion in the annual programs. Based on those comments, EPA's new projections determined that Texas SO2 emissions would be even higher than our earlier projections, confirming that Texas, like 27 other states, significantly contributed to downwind non-attainment problems. We have fully met our notice and comment obligations, both legally and in practice, with respect to Texas's inclusion in the cross-state program. Can Texas comply with the program in 2012? EPA understood that new SO2 pollution control equipment would not be able to be installed before 2012. So we designed the 2012 requirements to take advantage of already existing, not new, pollution control installations. NRG reportedly expects to meet the cross-state rule by increasing scrubber efficiency. It doesn't expect its compliance costs to be either material nor any plans to be shut down. Why are we able to start the program in 2012? Well, because CASPER is not the start of the state's obligation to reduce pollution that threatens the air quality in downwind states. That obligation to be a good neighbor was put in place by Congress when it passed the Clean Air Act. The Bush administration defined a pathway forward for states to meet this obligation when it issued CARE in 2005 but that rule was found not to be consistent with the Clean Air Act. CASPER is a replacement of CARE that is built on a stronger both legal as well as scientific foundation. Under CARE, states and power plants have already implemented or plan to implement pollution controls. CASPER, just like CARE, is a market-based program that gives companies compliance flexibility. It does not dictate a specific technology or require specific unit-by-unit unit reductions. Texas power plants have more than one cost-effective option that they can choose under the cross-state rule. Although the program starts in 2012, power plants' first compliance obligation, the first compliance obligation is not until March 1st of 2013. While the program starts in 2012, the first compliance for SO2, which is the biggest challenge that Texas faces, is March of 2013 when they're required to turn in allowances. So let me assure you, we do not want and we will not in any way force the lights to go out or the air conditioning to not be available within the state of Texas 
or anywhere else as a result of these rules. I look forward to your questions, and again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And we thank you for your testimony and reminding members that the committee rules uh, limit questioning normally to five minutes, but we have an agreement with this witness. She has uh, come before us with the understanding that she has to be away from here by noon. So we'll keep our uh, questions down to three minutes each in the interest of time and giving everyone a, a chance. And I think there'll be more here. And don't uh, take the absence of people in these chairs for uh, not caring to hear from you or getting a chance to ask you questions because we just swore in two new members over there and I think they're still in session. We were interrupted a couple of times. But we are taking this down, even TV and some of it, and they all will have copies of your testimony and our questions. And I've used a minute of my three minutes now expecting mm -hmm. you that. I just want to ask you this. Let's talk some about options. One of the major things that the others have, have set forth that have testified here today was the time and the effect of the time on it and the, uh, their inability to comply with that time. And it seems like to me that there ought to be some way to make some adjustment on that. Uh, I'm going to ask you about options, though. You state that EPA conducted analysis that demonstrates that Texas power plants have more than one cost-effective option to meet their obligations. Well, given the short period and severity of the cuts, uh, uh, buying allowances is extremely costly. That's one of them. Uh, it's evidenced by the price of $2,600 per ton we saw in the market last week. The other, fuel switching is not that easy. As most utilities purchase coal on long-term contracts, including for 2012, and additional control technologies can't be built in the next five months. After these options are eliminated, it's too costly or unfeasible, or what cost-effective solutions does EPA recommend and what are left? And I only have about a minute for you. Okay, then, then I'll be very quick. Okay. Uh, EPA does not uh, specifically require any particular uh, option to be developed at or to be chosen at any particular facility. It is an entirely, it's a business decision. It's a market approach to achieving these reductions. We believe that, that there is equipment installed in the state already that can be maximized in terms of its efficiency. Those are scrubbers for particulate matter that actually reduce SO2 emissions, one of the main concerns. There's also SCRs, SNCRs, low, low NOx boilers that are in place that can be turned on every day all year round instead of some of them are currently used part of the year, part of the days during that part of the year. There are also upgrades of pollution control equipment that can be done quickly. There's sim simple um, pollution control additions that can be made. There's lower sulfur coal. There is fuel switching. We believe that there are a number of options in addition to the purchasing of allowances. Let me interrupt you there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the options you've stated are not feasible, so what else do you have to offer, if anything? Actually, Mr. Chairman, we, we, we believe that all of those options are quite feasible and can be done to achieve the requirements by the time the, the first compliance period is, is required to be met, which for SO2 is March of 2013. Now, I will also add that we have been petitioned to look at this issue, and we are taking very seriously our obligation to look at that. If we believed that we have been incorrect as a result of those petitions and investigating those, every option is available to us. Well, it's been testified here, and, and those companies say that it can't be done. Uh, why does EPA think that they know better? Well, EPA in this particular rule identified not just the air quality reductions that needed to be made, but they also, uh, they also um, identified that we did not want companies in 2012 to have to expend significant funds to comply. We are looking at a very low cost per ton, and we believe that those tonnage reductions are available by the use of existing equipment, by the use of operational changes, fuel switching and other mechanisms that are very readily available to them today. I thank you. My time to recognize Mrs. Johnson for three minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you, um, Ms. McCarty, for appearing. Um, I don't disagree with the findings of EPA, although I know that there is some question. Uh, but what I do question is, 
how can we assure that Texas has other options other than the closure of the lignite mines and power plants in that time? And, and I want you to comment briefly, too. Dr. Uh, Smitherman indicated that it was a flawed process that you used, and I want you to comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Shaw indicated that you had bad data. And, uh, you know, these are serious indictments. And what I'd like to um, have you do is clarify uh, those issues. And Dr. Um, Steller indicated that it's, some things are assumed by the EPA. I think it's important for your credibility to be um, justified with, with how you do things and what rules you follow. Uh, thank you for asking those questions. Let me try to get at them very quickly. The first thing is, do, do we need to close, do, do companies need to choose to close the lignite facilities in order to comply? The simple answer is no. Uh, there, this system is set up to allow a number of choices, business choices. It may be that that business is chosen to take that path forward, but EPA anticipated that the, that the Texas may want to choose other options in, in the rule itself. We included information that indicated that you could maintain the same historical use of lignite coal in Texas and still achieve the reductions under the rule in, in, within the same cost constraints which make them very inexpensive reductions. So we believe you do not need to do that and we're sitting, do sitting down with the company in the state of Texas to walk through our analysis on that. And we had, you asked the question about uh, a flawed process. Uh, we believe we not only met the letter but the spirit of the law in terms of moving forward to include Texas in this annual program. They were in the CARE program. We, when we proposed this rule, we, w we were proposing to bring them in for the seasonal ozone. We also took comment on whether or not we should include them in the annual program. And it was comments from the state of Texas itself in response to that solicitation of comment that told us that they knew about this, they provided us information, and on the basis of the information they provided, we redid the modeling which clearly showed that Texas would increase its emissions if we brought in the cross-state rule, if we didn't bring in the cross-state rule, and the care program went away. So we feel very comfortable that we have both legally, as well as in the spirit of the law, done what we needed to do. Now the third issue is bad data. I will tell you that we strongly disagree with the data analysis, so the back of the envelope calculation that we heard from, uh, from uh, Mr. Shaw. We're going to walk through those issues, but we did a thorough analysis. And the last issue is, is uh, Stella in the modeling. Uh, let me tell you that, that Stella had some fatal flaws in the way it modeled this rule. Let me just name two. Uh, first of all, they failed to understand that we needed to look at pre-care data. We needed to do modeling, not just look at current monitoring data, because the court told us that care has to go away and has to go away quickly. We had to replace it. That's what this rule does. So we had to look at the world before care and make sure that we were backstopping all of those reductions and then moving forward. Secondly, by basing it on monitoring data, they're looking at a, a, an economy that has a downturn, and they're not recognizing that we want to make sure that Texas and other states have the ability to grow, and we factor in that growth when we do our analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Harris, for three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. McCarthy for appearing before the committee. I have a question as a physician. I just am curious that the claim that uh, this somehow saves money says that we avoid up to 34,000 premature deaths. Could you break that down to what these premature deaths are due to? Um, I, I can tell you that the analysis we do is on the basis of uh, health data. It looks at exposure. I understand that. Can you just break that down? What are these deaths due to? I'm not asking you what your practice is. What did you do in this? The deaths are due, due to? to the pollution. No, no. What, what diseases? Committed. Diseases. You, oh, and I'm you can sorry. use specific diagnoses it, for me. I'll understand them. It, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to presume that I could articulate them as, to the extent that you could understand them. We would have respiratory illnesses, heart illnesses. Well, you say 15,000 heart attacks per year. If every one of those patients died, I could see that's 15,000. 
The estimated number of asthma deaths per year on the EPA website is 10,000 per year uh, due to exacerbation. So that would be 25 if every one of those uh, was attributed to this. How do you get up to 34,000? I mean, and, I, and I'm used to science. When they say up to 34,000, there's usually a confidence interval there. You know, it's like 1 to 34,000 or 10 to 34,000. Why would you use something so unscientific as to say up to 34,000? The health data is all part of the record, and I would indicate to you that we are looking at health benefits. Okay, um, Can you, and that, thank you, could, and I'd appreciate if you... the United States. Sure, I understand that, and if you could get me that information, I'd appreciate it. Have now, is that health data due to the particulates or the ozone? Uh, it, w it would mostly be the particulate matter, but is that also right? certainly... Weren't these numbers the same numbers, though, that were floated around a week ago when the administration suspended its ozone standards? Uh, clearly not, no. They weren't? No, they were not. Uh, what were those figures? Um, I actually don't have them at the top of my head, but I certainly can provide them. I'd, I'd appreciate that because I recall that the, that the deaths uh, in the press reports uh, from the advocates were very, very similar to that. And uh, there's evidence, I think, that 90% of the health benefits claimed by the EPA under this rule are for particulates. So I'm just curious about that, is how many times you can count a death uh, for a rule for its... Uh, for its uh, proposed benefit, we do is, that are those particulate matter? Uh, are those particulate matter uh, the data that uh, supports that death and injury data? Is that publicly available? Yes. Yes, could, sir. Could you get that to me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, because uh, I'd, I'd uh, love to have in, you know it reviewed independently. Uh, from the EPA. I think and I should probably clarify only because I just uh, realized what you are indicating is that the 15,000 heart attacks that we reference are non-fatal. So that would be very different than the premature, than, than, than thinking that we Well, that, that's even worse because the number of people who have a heart attack who go on to die actually now under current therapy is actually quite low. So the number right. of deaths from heart attacks actually would be strikingly low as part of that 34,000. So I'm just curious about that. But anyway, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I appreciate follow-up on those two questions I asked. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for three minutes. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. I want to commend you because um, it sounds to me, and I don't profess to be an expert on on, on this, but it sounds to me from your testimony and from what I've read in the written testimony like um, the EPA is uh, taking a very responsible course with respect to this uh, cross-state air pollution rule and regime that it wants to put in place to protect people's safety and health. Um, even with respect to the concerns that have been raised by the, the Texas delegation, I think that your responses have been good and straightforward um, and indicate that there's no, there's no sort of uh, special uh, mission here to get Texas that you're trying to do your job. You understand um, that the downwind effects um, from pollution in one part of the country or one state have to be measured, um, have to be regulated. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, make progress with respect to these um, these air pollution issues. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, on ba on behalf of Marylanders. I know that um, the uh, the Maryland Department of Environment submitted some some comments uh, speaking to uh, concerns about the uh, nitrogen oxide uh, standards in the cross state air pollution rule. I think our, our uh, Secretary of Environment, Sherry Wilson, testified through those comments uh, that we're, you know, we're interested in making sure that standard's where it needs to be because we get a lot of, uh, of uh, air that blows into Maryland that's uh, above the, the levels um, with respect to national ambient air quality standard uh, for ozone. So can you just speak a little bit to how the rule that you're looking at you think would benefit uh, Marylanders who have that concern? I certainly can. The, the 27 states that are incorporated in the region that, that is regulated under this rule encompass three quarters of the United States population. Uh, we recognize that for many years the Clean Air Act has required states to take care of their downwind contribution, but we have failed to be able to achieve the reductions that were necessary to do that. This rule actually does a couple of things. First, it scientifically links 
where there is challenges in different states to achieve a non, a, that, that are trying to achieve non-attainment and are in non-attainment, let me say that again, that are out of attainment, that need to get in attainment, and also where they, how they can maintain that. We know that Maryland and other states in the East have had significant challenges and met those challenges in their own states. But because of pollution from upwind states, they continually are trying to drive more reductions at higher and higher cost per ton. This rule makes the link to the upwind states scientifically. But then we look at how do we also look at where there are cost-effective reductions up there so that we can bring those reductions to the table because we don't expect the upwind states to bring the downwind into attainment but meet their own significant contribution. So this rule will go significantly far to help Maryland and other states that have been recipients of this pollution to get into and to maintain attainment. Gentleman's time has expired. expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Brown, for three minutes. Ms. McCarthy, in testimony last week, you said it's not EPA's jobs, not EPA's purpose of creating jobs. Ma'am, this rule of yours is going to destroy jobs and it's going to greatly harm our economy. Now, the questions I have are these. The final cross-state rule is significantly more stringent than the proposed rule. The cross-state rule requires more emissions reductions and imposes new regulations on the trading of allowances. Can you explain why the final rule, why the final rule was much more stringent? Do you think it is practical for power plants which have been looking at the proposed rule for almost a year now and developing compliance plans based on that rule and how without notice get a final rule which is m much more stringent to be able to suddenly change those compliant plans and only have until January 1st to make those changes. Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, the, I'd like to point out that, that I, 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 the context of my, my statement uh, from last week needs Mr. to McCarthy, really be McCarthy, I ask you a question. I just made a statement with that. Would you please answer my question because I don't have but a minute and a half left. I've got okay. well, several well, other questions. My statement is we're not insensitive to jobs, and I certainly am not. Well, we you're do not believe destroy them, but if you would, will... please go ahead and answer my question. I appreciate it. I thought I was doing that. I apologize. No. So we have looked at the rule. We have designed it in a way that not only can be achieved in terms of, of achieving the air quality reductions, but very costly. You're not answering my question. Why is it more stringent than the proposed rule? Well, because we, we have updated our data, and it's the basis of emissions that are being emitted, and it takes advantage of current technologies that are in place to continue to drive. How, how do you think down. a power company can, when they've been planning for almost a year, to put in place plans to to follow this new this new rule well, actually, many power companies have known, and all of them should have known, that this program has actually been in place since 2005. The courts told us we had to replace it. No, but it, you've changed the so proposed they, rule to this new rule. Let me ask you another question. Shouldn't the public have been given an opportunity to comment on this final rule since it's so different from the original proposal? It, 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 they were given uh, ample opportunity to comment, and it is not significantly different than the proposed rule. Ma'am, it is. The final uh, cross-state rule will have significant real impacts in starting in just over three months because power plants cannot install technologies to reduce emissions in such a short period of time. Plants will be restricted on how much they can uh, run starting next year. I believe this will raise costs for utility customers. Did EPA reach out to state regulators and public utility commissioners on the details of the final cross-state rule before you issued it? We met with, with states as well as companies continuously through the proposal as well as prior to the final and after the final. Would and you we, submit, please, for the record, the dates and names of such contacts? Sure. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. My time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Maryland, Mrs. Edwards, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to the ranking member for the hearing. And uh, I just want to say uh, first, really thank you to the Environmental Protection Agent, uh, Administration and under the direction of Lisa Jackson. I think that you all are doing yeoman's work in a really difficult environment uh, to balance the interests of business, but also the public interest in protecting our, our health and our air quality. And so I want to thank you for your 
leadership. Uh, I, I know that Maryland has actually some of the toughest uh, rules along the East Coast, but I think one of the challenges that we face is that we can't ju we're not just a state that's an island on its own. That part of the reason that we need the uh, EPA to take a broad look across uh, state boundaries is because air travels across state boundaries, and so it makes entire sense uh, that the EPA has really taken this on to try to balance all of those interests but to ensure the, uh, the public health. And so I thank you for that uh, commitment. Ms. McCarthy, I want uh, to just ask you um, one thing. Isn't it true that the new rule is in fact less stringent than the rule that the court remanded? Um, it is. Um it actually is, is uh, it's designed with the same market flexibility. Um, it is based on better data than we had before. Um, and it still offers a broad range of options for facilities to come into compliance, either through cost-effective reductions at their own facilities or through the market in the purchase of allowances. And I note that. I know that you received um, testimony in the rulemaking from Constellation Energy in Maryland, which is one of our largest uh, energy companies. And what they've said is they've already made a billion-dollar investment in trying to come, making sure that they come into uh, compliance. Um, and they're urging the EPA, in fact, to act quickly to implement the rules. And so it's, and you've heard from a, new, a number of energy companies saying exactly the same thing. I was actually out at FedEx uh, Field just a while ago with NRG, which is installing solar panels there. Uh, they, too, have also said, the, you know, the same thing. It's time for the EPA to act so that there is clarity um, in, the, in the industry as to the direction that we ought to go, um, but not to leave them in this limit unclear of what the investments are going to make. And so I wonder, uh, I, I wonder if you could uh, talk about what, if any, other options are really available to the EPA to address the part of the ruling that says, you know, there are a lot of different alternatives um, for the industry to take. Well, first of all, I, I want to tell you that, that Maryland is one of the 27 states in, in the cross-state air pollution rule. And in that region, on average, those states have reduced their SO2 emissions since 1990 by 70 percent. So congratulations. But what we're here to talk about is the, is the states that may not have been as prepared. If you look at comparable timelines in the state of Texas, they are almost where they started. SO2 reductions in Texas have been reduced from 1990 to today only by 0.1 percent. So we, we have a challenge here. It has expired. Now I recognize the chairman from California, a uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, for three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you were just about to suggest uh, what the trend line was. Let, let me ask you, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, the trend line in terms of uh, uh, cleanliness uh, of our air has been in what direction? Uh, for most of the major pollutants, it's significantly reduced. Significantly reduced. Yes, and correct. so uh, now we find ourselves uh, in a situation where the EPA, even though there's a trend line going dramatically in the right direction, has decided that they have to move up a deadline. And, and w what business is calling draconian, we just had uh, five witnesses in front of us talking about that, that this uh, moving up the deadline will cost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that otherwise wouldn't cost. So what's the, uh, uh, what's the crisis that makes you uh, move up the deadline at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars to the American people? Uh, the courts were telling us that EPA had to act to, to respond to the, remand, the vac original vacature of care and then its remand. I will say that, that the, while the trend lines nationally have gone down, there are some states that have not sufficiently yeah. looked at the ability okay. to use uh, did cost the court, Did the court set this deadline? Down. You're saying the court set the deadline for you? The courts told us we had to, to correct. Did they set the deadline for you? The, no. The deadline the answer, was as soon answer, as possible. The answer, yes. So the answer is no, they did not set a, a deadline. Do you think the courts wanted you to waste hundreds of millions of dollars of American people's money in order to move up a deadline that could be achieved uh, at, at lo a lot less costly uh, within a year or two? Our deadlines are achievable with cost-effective reductions. Uh, you're, you're, uh, that's not what we just heard in testimony from, from people who probably have as much expertise on this as you do. Uh, but 
uh, as we here we are in the uh, aftermath of a, of a of a of an actual uh, case in California where five hundred million dollars was given by this administration to a solar panel company that then uh, went bankrupt again evaporating hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars uh, yet we have an example of another company on September 11 2011 a letter to uh, 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 the deputy uh, administrator of the EPA that the EPA suggests that the EPA has offered to make technical adjustments that will give Texas and luminant thousands of additional tons of pollution allowances to reduce required emissions reductions uh, now, let me ask this, is this just for this particular uh, group or have uh, other companies across the uh, country been offered this uh, technical adjustments that will allow uh, for additional uh, 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 allowances? Well, in order to ensure that the reductions could be achievable in 2012 at a low cost, mm -hmm. we, we took good, great care to look at what kind of technologies were already in place that could achieve those reductions quickly. Mm -hmm. right. Luminant came to us, as well as the state of Texas, and identified three scrubbers within the state of Texas that had been on a pathway to be invested in and be ready to turn on in so 2012. So any other utilities so across the country adjust ask for this? The, 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 we, this is the, the only example nobody, uh, of no, where people no, have asked no. for this? There are, there are about uh, a little over a handful of adjustments we're making on the basis of technology installations that right. are in place and ready to be turned on. But, uh, but others the particular have requested concern, The particular concern we have with Luminant is they have chosen to make an announcement that they're actually closing mines associated with burning lignite when we believe they haven't thoroughly looked at all of their options or given us an opportunity well, to I make would hope these you would be. I hope you'd be as concerned about the other people who are losing hundreds of millions of dollars in jobs we, because we of this precipitous action on the part of the EPA and perhaps uh, uh, we will see who gets special favors. We know that this uh, solar company got it in California and ended up costing the taxpayers $500 million. Gentlemen's time is about to really expire. <laughs> I just, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say that, that we are talking to a number of states that there, if there are technical adjustments, we are making them. There's no special favors here. Gentleman has expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Nogabauer, gentleman from Texas, for three minutes. Uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go back to and kind of make sure we're, we're uh, correct here. The court said that care could stay in place until a replacement was put in place. Is that correct? And they told us to do it as expeditiously as no, but, possible because Kia was not legal. Now, you didn't answer my question. I did. No, you didn't. I said, Ian, you told you're, me, co you're correct, no, and they but, added no. other, uh, other, other requirements for us okay, to get it but, done as possible. But they did possible. say it could stay in place until a replacement could be. That is correct. They remanded yes. it instead it of vacant. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, thank you. It, but it never said that the EPA could not take into account the gains that were made under CARE, right? It, for, it didn't, for, it for the didn't improvements that, that were made under, un, uh, under that particular. I, I don't believe it t took into account that particular issue. I, d I don't know in what context we would take credit for gains or not. Well, some of those companies were banking, and they were, they were making improvements and in, in, in banking. Oh, they those. were, but they clearly told us that we couldn't continue with the CARE program or, or the use of those banked allowances. Did they, the court told you you could not use that the banked allowances? That is allowance? correct. Are you sure about that? Yes. So, so we are sure. So, so we had a, we had some legislation in place, and companies spent billions of dollars, uh, you know, under that program, making improvements, uh, getting getting credits for doing that, and then we're, we're coming out with this new rule that says, you know, what all of that great stuff you did in the past, you, you, we're not going to give you credit for that. Is that right? Uh, uh, I don't – let let me explain how we did it. We actually looked at the achievements that have been made with CARE 
we looked at the air quality reductions that would be necessary to, to make to, which, to help with the attainment and maintenance issues in downwind states. And then we looked upwind at where the inexpensive reductions could be made, and then we established state budgets accordingly. That does not mean we ignored or didn't consider all of the benefits. And in fact, over the past five years, there's been significant installation of pollution control equipment as a result of care that we're taking advantage of. That's why we can move forward in 2012 with cost-effective reductions. So are you using the 2005 data or the 2009 data? We are using both current monitoring data as well as modeling data in order to establish those linkages to look at how to allocate the pollution from the upwind states and then in order to establish those budgets. So we're looking at both monitoring, monitoring and modeling data. But you are absolutely right that we are looking at identifying the pollution that would be emitted without care in order to establish those budgets, recognizing that those states that have been aggressive in care would be able to achieve reductions or even, in some cases, already be in compliance with 2012 levels. But if you're using 2005 data, you may not be using uh, uh, current data then. We are actually using a combination of both current monitoring data as well as modeling data to understand what the world would have looked like without care because the world will be without care when the cross-state rule comes into place, then to model what, the, what those, those monitors would look like using both information at the monitor itself as well as our modeling data to make those adjustments. Well, I know it's complicated, and I apologize, but I, I certainly can send you how we did our modeling and how we made our projections, but we feel very confident that it's the way that it needs to be done in order to actually backstop from any backsliding if care goes away and the cross-state rule uh, uh, takes over. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, recognized for three minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, with all due respect, I, I believe uh, at a time we're trying to create jobs uh, in the Congress and the administration, your agency is, is destroying jobs and causing real harm, justifying it uh, based on possible noncompliance in the future. Uh, I believe this rule will result in higher prices for electricity. Uh, it's already shut down two plants. Uh, it's being imposed on Texas with absolutely very short warning. Uh, and Texas has been included not because of actual measurements that show problems, but because of models that show hypothetical problems uh, in the future. And we heard that testimony from the previous panel. Uh, my questions, I have two questions. One is that um, because Texas was not included in the initial rule, uh, state agencies, energy companies, and residents did not have the opportunity to offer their input into the rulemaking process. Uh, I understand that Texas was included in the final rule, but why were Texans are not given the opportunity afforded to others to offer their suggestions and concerns on this rule and make the necessary preparations for compliance once you decided to include us. And I'll, I'll say there are six other states that were added in the final rule, and they were provided a time uh, to pro a supplement supplementary notice on their inclusion that allowed them uh, time to comment. Uh, yet Texas was not treated in the same way and provided this similar type of notice. And rather, we were just put on the final rule. Now, would you mind commenting to those two questions? No, I, I don't mind commenting. But first of all, the, the cross-state rule does not shut down facilities. It's the most flexible market-based approach that we have to achieve cost-effective reductions. Um, if EPA, if you're... If you uh, would like, uh, I'd refer you to the Houston Chronicle article today that's entitled Don't Blame EPA Over Luminant Woes. You know, we are not to blame for Luminant's financial trouble. We can achieve reductions, and they can achieve those reductions, we believe, without the closure of those facilities, and we would like to see that happen. We'd like to uh, comply, but, going. yeah, I think it, <laughs> you need to be reasonable <clears throat> and not, you know, just shove us into a rule without any input oh. from the state and not giving us time to, to, uh, to you know, uh, have input <clears throat> the way you did six other states. That doesn't seem fair to me. Yeah. And it, as a Texan, it looks like that you're being unfair with Texas and, and that this administration is playing unfair with the I, state I clearly don't want you to walk away f think, believing that because Texas, in terms of their air quality emissions and what we expect of them, is the same process that we use for every state to identify their contribution and make reductions. I will tell you that, that we did solicit comment. Um, it disturbs me that, that Texas is now claiming that they didn't have due process. 
We have been as transparent as we possibly could be with this rule. We solicited comment, and the fact that they actually commented um, should deflate that issue somewhat or that claim. If I could just close, my time no. has expired. Uh, again, you have six other states, Iowa, Kansas, we Michigan, did. Missouri, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin, added in the final rule. They were provided with a supplementary notice on their inclusion that allowed for their comment. Because it was on the basis of new data and the proposal didn't, didn't request comment on their inclusion. So we did have to do a supplemental rule. That is not the same situation as the state of Texas. So Texas was treated differently than these six other states. We had different data at the time that we put the proposal out. We actually solicited comment on their inclusion and they provided comment. We adjusted our model and indeed they significantly contribute to, to, to pollution in downwind states. Well, I just, you know, in closing, Mr. Chairman, I, I do think that uh, uh, if, if we are treated differently, there is a, it, it, I understand your position. I understand. But I, I do think it, it really uh, it smacks of unfairness. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, uh, we'll have some insertions into the record. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, Gentlelady has a letter uh, request. Do you want to state your request? We, we, we can do it. We, we, can do it. There. we have it. Okay. Um, well, I might can do it for you here if you want me to. Okay. The, uh, I would like to ask for the the letter that the delegation signed be okay. submitted uh, okay. for the record as well as the one from um, Donnergy, uh that was uh, yeah. sent. Well, to both of us. Yeah, I think that's for acceptable. The record. At this time, I'd like to enter into the hearing record a number of important letters and documents containing stakeholder viewpoints and technical analysis regarding the Casper rule. This includes several pieces of correspondence between affected utilities and EPA and an analysis by ERCOT of the rule's impact on reliability and analysis of the economic and job-killing impacts of the rule by NERO economic consulting as well as standard and poor. And these documents have all been shared in advance with the minority and with the majority, and a complete list can be made available to members at their request. I just have, uh, and Ms. McCarthy, just yesterday the chairman of the Texas House Committee on State Affairs, Byron Cook, sent you a letter requesting your appearance at a committee hearing on Casper Rule on September 22nd at 10 a.m. in Austin. As Chairman Cook wrote, it's absolutely essential that this agency explain to Texas why the state was unexpectedly without opportunity for input included in this rule. Will you accommodate Chairman Cook's request to appear at the Texas Committee hearing? Mr. Hall, I'll take that request under due consideration. All right, I'll appreciate it if you will. And I'd like to leave, this, leave it open long enough for your callous remark that you're not in the business of creating jobs. You don't really mean that, do you? I actually didn't put it in that context. I, I, was, a sh I, I was actually providing information. If you want to make a statement, make it for the record, and I'll see if I would, but both there. EPA Thank as you. well as I personally um, am very concerned, not just about the environmental health, but also the economic health of this state. And I recognize, and, and EPA does its responsibility to develop rules as cost effective. You can talk on from now on if you want to, because we're on your time now. No, sir, I just No, you, clearly you need to be gone by 12 and it's I, 5 I after 12, and we thank I, I you for staying. I just didn't want you to believe that I was callous to job. Well, I want to believe that. I sure do. Please do. Uh, and we thank you for your time here and wish you well. You too, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Round of questions completed. I thank the witnesses for both of the panels for valuable testimony and members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for any one of the witnesses. We'll ask the witnesses, including Mrs. McCarthy, to respond to those in writing. Record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments on members. We don't have, we are adjourned. Yeah. adjourned.